Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pastor Fletcher Wright at National. I want to welcome you to our Thursday Bible study. And you know, for several weeks, we've been talking about kingdom principles and just taking the kingdom of God and opening up the operation, the principles that govern that particular kingdom. We have discovered that God, who is the Spirit, came here in history past and created this physical realm. But then God introduced the laws in the spiritual realm, praise God, to begin to even be expressed in the physical realm. In other words, God, who is the Spirit, created all spiritual things. Absolutely, God is a Spirit. But when we begin to look at this earthly realm, we find out that God instituted, He set in motion, laws that we call the laws of sowing and reaping in this natural realm. So they govern both the natural realm and the spiritual realm. And so we've been talking about that. Let's open in prayer. Father, we honor you today and give you praise. And Lord, I thank you today for your precious word being revealed to us that we can begin to walk in the light of that word. Lord, we want to comprehend and understand the significance, the importance of your kingdom and how to activate the principles of those kingdom, of your kingdom in our life. We thank you for it today. Anoint me to speak your word and every listener to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm not going to turn back to Mark 4 today, but let me just touch in review. There Jesus began to share about a natural parable. They questioned him about the natural parable, and he said, Know ye not this parable? Then how will you know all parables? And then he began to introduce the spiritual significance of that natural parable. And then he said, The sower soweth the word. So we find out that he only spoke of the seed in the natural to reveal the operation of the word of God in the spiritual. In other words, like the seed contains potential to reproduce a harvest, the word of God contains the potential to reproduce a harvest in our life. And we have discovered that every seed reproduces after its own kind. Amen. And we know, in matter of fact, touching there uh, in Mark 4, he said, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? Well, that lets me know that I need to stay in Mark chapter 4 until I understand the significance of what he was saying. In other words, if we do not fully understand the principles that he's revealing in Mark chapter 4, then we're going to be very limited concerning our understanding in the other principles pertaining to the Word of God and the Kingdom of God. And so we begin to find out that he uh, expresses uh, the truth in the natural to express the truth in the spiritual. So the sower soweth the Word. And then he began to talk about the opposition that the enemy will present against the Word. We know over in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, that the, his number one desire is that he would blind the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel who uh, is the image of Christ should shine unto them. But if he's not successful in blinding people to the truth of the gospel and they receive that word, then have you know the enemy doesn't give up. It says when that word is sown in their hearts, he comes immediately in an attempt to steal that word out of their hearts. And then it begins to reveal the opposition, the weapons, the devices, the strategies of the enemy. It says when that word is sown, he comes immediately and said that he brings affliction and persecution. And then it goes on later in that, uh, in that same parable to say, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things. Now those influences do not come from God. They come from the enemy to hinder you from receiving the increase from God's Word. What God's Word contains is what God desires for us to receive. The very fact that God gives us a seed indicates it's His desire that we receive a harvest. Amen. But the enemy wants to hinder that. And so we find out that there in Mark 4, spiritual warfare broke out concerning the Word of God. 
And so as we begin to study that, we find out that the word of God has the potential to bring forth the increase, just like the word of the enemy has potential to bring forth an increase. We discover there's two different kingdoms in this earthly realm, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And both of those kingdoms operate under the laws of increase. Amen. But the increase that is received depends upon the seed that has been sown. Now, just because we sow the word doesn't mean we're going to reap the harvest because if the enemy steals that out in the seed stage, steals the word out in our hearts in the seed stage, then the potential for increase has been removed. But if we hold on to the word of God, the Bible says, hold fast your profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. So it is our responsibility to fulfill the working relationship. You remember all the way back in the beginning of this series there in Corinthians, we talked about the fact that we've entered into a working relationship with the Heavenly Father. And then in that working relationship, then we take the word that God has already provided and then we plant that word, we water that word. But guess what? God will confirm that word. He will bring the increase. He watches over his word to perform it in our behalf. But him, you know, it's our responsibility to guard, keep, protect that word from the enemy. Do not allow the adversary to steal the seed out of the ground before the harvest comes forth. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we started talking about the opposition there in Mark 4. And we talked about the potential of the seed. And it says the kingdom of God is as if a man should cast seed into the ground. And then he should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. Guess what? We don't have to know how because that is God's responsibility to bring the increase. But we're responsible for taking the seed of God's word, putting that in our heart. Amen. And then we not only plant, but we water, praise God, and then God watches over his word. He brings the increase. Amen. Hallelujah. But we have discovered that when we sow the word of God in our heart, remember there in verse 30 in Mark 4, he said, uh, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. In other words, when you first came to the word of God, the seed of his word, hallelujah, that was not the first time you had been introduced to the laws of sowing and reaping. But we find out that when we came to that uh, saving knowledge of Jesus, amen, and we started getting in the word of God, and it seems like that that word is small and insignificant compared, uh, compared to our problems that are already in the harvest stage because of the laws of sowing and reaping that we have been operating in up until that time. But it says, where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God? With what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed. That means this, that when you first receive the word of God, it's in the seed stage, which when it is sown, in the, it's less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, guess what? It groweth up and becometh greater. That means that the word of God has the potential of growing up and becoming greater than every influence that has been introduced into your life through the laws of sowing and reaping concerning the kingdom of Satan. Amen. Many times people are uh, actually sowing in areas that they do not even know anything about the devil, whatever, but they're just operating in a negative lifestyle, a negative manner, death and life or in the power of the tongue. And it says, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Well, I praise God that we can come to the knowledge of God's word where we can begin to plant a different harvest. But that harvest will begin in the seed stage. It may even look like a mustard seed in comparison to your problems and your difficulties. But when it is sown, the, one translation says, but after it is sown, 
it groweth up. It groweth up and becometh greater. And then it's going to grow up. And it's going to produce the harvest 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so the kingdom of God has the potential of reproducing the will of God in your life because Jesus has provided the fullness of redemption and then he has invested that into the seed of his word. And when we receive that word in our heart, praise God, it can grow up and become great in our life and even greater than every other influence. Amen. But we also discovered last week, and matter of fact, I'm going to pick up over in Second uh, Corinthians. Matter of fact, we'll just turn over there for a moment. Second Corinthians in chapter 10. Praise the Lord. And there, uh, we last week we started talking about the operation of Satan's kingdom. Now remember, Satan is a counterfeiter. He is not the creator. If he gets anything to work for him, he has to counterfeit the laws that God set in motion. And he introduced a law called the law of sin and death in this earth when he brought sin through the disobedience of humanity. Amen. It set in motion that law of sin and death. But the good news is that God sent a redeemer. I made a statement one time. Let me just repeat it. Literally, the primary purpose for Jesus coming into this earth was to establish a higher law than the law of sin and death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we find out that when the law of sin and death came into this earthly realm, God sent his son Jesus to establish a higher law than the law of sin and death. If it was not for that law of life, we would continually be subject to the law of sin and death. There would be no way out. I compared that to the law of gravity because humanity was held in bondage to this earth for thousands of years because of the law of gravity. They could not uh, move up beyond the highest treetop or the highest mountain. They could look at the birds and wish and hope, but that's as far as they could go. But because new laws, a higher law than the law of gravity, was introduced called the laws of aviation, the laws of lift and thrust. And now we can go to the airport. We can get in a big plane. In a few moments, we can be soaring above this earth completely free from the law of gravity. Does that mean the law of gravity has ceased to exist? No, it is very much still in existence. Turn off the engine, you'll come face to face with the reality that that law of gravity is still in effect. Amen. Well, we have to operate in a higher law that Jesus has provided. When you act upon the word of God, you are activating a higher law than the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. It says there in 1 Peter uh, one twenty three that we quote often, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Praise God that the word of God is eternal. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall endure for how long? Forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we have to activate that higher law, and that sets us free from the influence of the enemy. We've been delivered out of the power of darkness, and we've been translated over into the kingdom of his dear son. Hallelujah. But let's look here uh, in Second Corinthians in chapter 10. We left off here last week because we discovered there's two different kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of God. Both operate under the laws of increase, but the seed determines the harvest, and therefore that's where the struggle takes place. The enemy wants to control the sowing process in your life so he can control the harvest. He wants to control your future, and therefore he challenges the sowing process and how many of you know that we want to take authority over that and we want to activate 
a sowing process in our life where we are activating the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we begin to look at the enemy and the activity of his kingdom and how he desires to gain influence over our life. And I'm going to begin reading that in verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not, or we do not war after the flesh. Oh my goodness. For the weapons of our warfare, notice that we are in a warfare, are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Pulling down of strongholds. That means that a stronghold has been established in the life of this individual. But that's not the end of the story. God has provided us with weapons that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But how many know it would be much better if we lived a lifestyle that never allowed the enemy to establish a stronghold in our life in the first place? And that's what this study is all about. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. And a stronghold from the enemy comes into existence because the law of sin and death has been activated in the life of that individual and has eventually produced a harvest. And that harvest is called a stronghold. Praise God. Oh, let's read on. We'll pick up in four again. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Last week, I emphasized those three words, stronghold, imaginations, and thoughts because those are three different stages of a season this person is encountering because they have activated the wrong seed in their life that eventually is going to produce a wrong harvest if it is not dealt with. Now, if we receive a word from God, then have you know the enemy comes immediately in the seed stage to try to abort that harvest before it can grow up and produce the increase. Amen. And we made this statement before. We should at least have as much sense as the devil. And we need to learn to deal with the enemy in the seed stage. So we're going to talk about dealing with the enemy in the seed stage. And stopping the harvest that he desires to bring forth. And so here, let's look at this in reverse. In Mark 4, it said, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And then it says 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. It's talking about the same principles of increase. But here, in relationship to the enemy and the adversary, uh, it begins to address that, starting with the harvest and then backing up to find out where that harvest originated from. Hey, you know, every harvest does not begin as a harvest. It begins as a seed. And so here it talked, first of all, about the stronghold, which is just another word for the word harvest. And then it talked about imagination. And then it talked about thoughts. Thoughts represents a thought from the enemy, a word from the enemy. Jesus told his disciples, take no thought saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? So this thought literally represents a seed or a word from the enemy. But how are we to deal with this in order to stop that from growing up and producing a harvest called a stronghold? How are we to stop the enemy and his influence from controlling that season in our life? We said before that a stronghold simply as an indication that the enemy has gained control of that season in that person's life. Amen. But here, when if we receive a thought from the enemy, we should respond the same way that the enemy operates when we receive a thought from God. He comes immediately, and you know, we need to deal with the enemy immediately in the seed stage or here in the thought stage. 
And it says that we are to do what? It says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, who is the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwell among us. Amen. Jesus would always bring the thoughts of the enemy, the words of the enemy, into captivity to the obedience of God's Word. He would declare, it is written, it is written, it is written. And that's what we need to do. We need to bring every thought of the enemy into captivity to the obedience of God's Word, but we need to know it is written. We need to know what the Word of God has to say. We may hear what the adversary, the enemy, is saying about that situation in our life, but what does the Word of God have to say? Well, we're not going to stop just by rebuking that thought and casting that thought out. Well, we've got to take another step and we've got to bring that thought into captivity. Into captivity to what? To the obedience of Christ, the Word of God. Devil, it is written, it is written, it is written. Replace the thoughts of the enemy with the thoughts of God or with His Word. It is His Word that God is going to confirm by bringing an increase. In Jesus' name, amen. So we can see the warfare takes place over the sowing process in our life. Never allow the enemy to come along and plant his word, his thoughts, into your life without bringing a response. Hallelujah. We're to bring that into captivity. If the enemy brings symptoms of sickness into your body, and then he begins to talk to you about uh, the condition, the end results. How I many you know the enemy brings symptoms of sickness and then he starts giving us this image of being in bed, sick, in the hospital, all of these kind of things that come from the enemy. Amen. But we need to respond by bringing that thought into captivity to what God says in his word. How I many you know in Matthew eight seventeen, the Bible declares that himself took our infirmities. He bare our sicknesses. In First Peter 2, 24, it declares, By his stripes ye were healed. If we were healed, we are healed. But we need to take that word and put that word in our heart. We need to activate that. And we need to take the word of God and bring every thought of the enemy into captivity to the word of God and what God's word has to say about our life. Amen. So regardless of the challenge from the enemy, and you know, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, amen, that we have great and precious promises given to us, amen. So the warfare takes place over the sowing process. So we want to bring that thought of the enemy into captivity to the obedience of Christ or the word of God. Hallelujah. And if we do not bring that thought into captivity, we discovered this, that it goes on to say that eventually that thought will become an imagination. What is an imagination? It's the thought that has not been brought into captivity to the obedience of God's word. And an imagination is something that occupies your thought life continually. You think about it in the morning and at noon. If you wake up in the middle of the night, it's the first thing that comes to your mind. It's an imagination, but it started as a thought. And if we do not deal with that in the imagination stage, remember, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. You said, well, that's pertaining to the kingdom of God. Well, what I'm saying is this, the devil is a counterfeiter. He takes those laws of sowing and reaping and uses them in a negative manner. He uses them to activate the law of sin and death in our life. But the greater law, the law of the spirit of life, has made us free from that law. But we have to activate the law, the spirit of life. And we do that through the word of God. We do it through the power of prayer. We do it through the name of Jesus. But eventually that seed of God's word has to be planted in your heart because how I many you know the seed determines the harvest. Praise God. Hallelujah. The earth 
The ground, the type of our heart and spirit doesn't determine the harvest. The seed determines the harvest. But we have to determine what seed we're going to allow to be planted in our heart and in our life. Amen. That's called spiritual warfare. I said before, all spiritual warfare revolves around the Word of God. Well, let's move on. Praise God. So we're wanting to approach this from the standpoint uh, standpoint of beginning in the seed stage. And therefore, we find out we want to deal with this uh, uh, influence of the enemy before it becomes a stronghold. But we find out here, if we do not bring that thought into captivity, the obedience of God's word, it's going to become an imagination. And then if not dealt with properly, eventually it will become a stronghold. Did it begin as a stronghold? No, it started out as a thought or a seed or a word from the enemy that gained control of that season of our life. And at the end of that season, we find out that a harvest from the enemy called a stronghold has been established. Well, the good news is God has given us weapons that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But once again, isn't it much better to learn to deal with the enemy in the seed stage that we do not have to try to deal with the enemy in the harvest stage? Oh, my goodness. Oh, praise the Lord for the power of his word. And we praise God for his word and the influence. You know, uh, Jesus was teaching over uh, in uh, Luke. As a matter of fact, I'm going to flip over there for just a moment. And Luke chapter 11. And let me just touch on a principle here. Because, I mean, you know this, that the enemy not only desires to produce a harvest in our life. Amen. But we have to learn to get rid of that harvest. Praise God. And even if we are set free from that, I mean, you know, the Bible indicates that the enemy will try to come back again. And matter of fact, let me find my right place here over in Luke 11. Uh, and here in verse 14, Jesus is teaching and sharing a particular story. And uh, matter of fact, in verse 14, it says, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wandered. In other words, Jesus is ministering uh, to him, to this person. And he is casting out a spirit that out of, he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. That sounds just like the devil, doesn't it? And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casted out devil by Beelzebub, the chief of the devils, and others, tempting him, saw of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against it, uh, a house falls. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because he that, but because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub, and if I cast out, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children or your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I, with the finger of God, in Matthew it says, with the spirit of God, same thing. But if I, with the finger of God, the Spirit of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come unto you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all of his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoil. This is simply the picture of Jesus setting this person free. And praise God for that. Hallelujah. But then in verse number 24, it says, But when the unclean spirit is gone out 
of a man. Now, this is building up on this same story that has already been given. Jesus setting this person free of this demonic influence. Amen. But here he says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. And he saith, I will return unto my house, the house here representing this person that has just been delivered and set free. And so we find out when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He said, I will return unto my house which I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. He findeth it swept and garnished. One translation says he found it empty, swept, and garnished, which is correct. In other words, when Jesus set this person free, and you know, he was free. But we find out that's not the end of the story. In other words, if we get set free from influences of the enemy, then how many of you know this? Then we have to do something, praise God, in order to fortify our lives by taking the word of God and establishing that word in our life. If we're delivered and set free, then praise God. What are we going to do? But here it says, and when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. In other words, this person was completely free, but he says, now when he returns after a season of time, you remember over, I'm not going to turn there, but over uh, in the Bible, uh, it says, matter of fact, in Luke, it says that the enemy, uh, you know, Jesus was led into the wilderness, being tempted of the devil for, for 40 days, and then that challenge took place, and then, but Jesus conquered the enemy by declaring, it is written, it is written, it is written, and it says, and the devil departed from him for a season you see, things operate in seasons in our life. Even God deals with us in seasons. And here we find out that not only do we want to be set free from that stronghold, that influence of the enemy, but then guess what? We have to understand this, that after a season of time, the enemy may come back and check out that individual. And if he finds the house the individual, empty, swept, and garnished, then the Bible indicates that he's going to come back even with reinforcements. Notice it says in verse 25, Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. What is he simply indicating? In other words, if we get set free from the influence of the enemy, regardless of what it may be, then what are we to do? We are to take the word of God and get that word established in our heart and in our life. Someone else may pray for that individual and through the prayers of another, they may be set free. But then we need to have instruction from the word that now we need to maintain our deliverance. We need to maintain our liberty by getting in the word of God and putting that word in our heart. It says over in Proverbs, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. That means this, that you have to put that word in your heart and then you have to guard, keep, protect, and preserve that word. Amen. Because if the enemy comes back and he finds out that person has done absolutely nothing with the word. They've not been building up their life in the things of God. Then they are vulnerable to the enemy. But if we get in the word of God, we build ourselves up on our most holy faith, praying in the spirit, putting the word of God in our heart and in our life, then it will be like Jesus where literally he said, the prince of this world cometh, but he had nothing in me. Hallelujah. And so we need to literally examine our lives, deal with issues 
that would represent a doorway or access to the enemy and get rid of that. Amen. Put the word of God in our heart. So even with Jesus, the devil departed from him for a season. That means he was going to come back again at a better opportunity. But Jesus did not give place to the devil. And it says in Ephesians, speaking to us, it says, neither give place to the devil. Oh my goodness. The power of God's word is so important in the life of every individual. The kingdom principle, hallelujah, taking the word of God, investing that word in our life, hallelujah, allowing that word to be the influence is going to reveal God's will, amen. The beautiful thing about the word of God is it begins to reveal a lifestyle that we can begin to deal with influences that should not have control in our life. Amen. Praise the Lord. And as we take that word and put that word in our heart, it's going to become greater than every influence of the enemy. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with me today. I want to invite you to be with us in our prayer session tomorrow night at National at 7.30. Now, uh, next week, I'll be talking about a different schedule for a period of time uh, at National. We're fixing to enter in to a 21-day Daniel fast beginning the day after Labor Day. I believe that is September the 6th, and we'll go for 21 days. And so we'll have a little bit different schedule and we'll probably have a different subject. I'll probably be sharing with you a little bit about prayer and fasting for those three weeks. Amen. But for tomorrow night, we're on the same schedule, 7.30 to 8.30 and our time of prayer and further instruction will be given later. But, and join with us Sunday morning at the National Church of God as we get together to worship our Lord. If you're out of this area, Go to church Sunday. God bless you.